Well, I want first to thank very much uh, Prince Faisal Al Faran to have come uh, here, especially from uh, Riyadh, uh, to, to talk with us uh, tonight. And uh, immediately after uh, our discussion, he will uh, fly back uh, to uh, Riyadh for a dinner. My, my only, I would be totally happy if uh, you had invited me for dinner in Riyadh tonight. Uh, but nevertheless, it is such a present to be here that nevertheless, I am very pleased. Well, Thierry, thank you. I'm extremely pleased to be able to be here and uh, to have a conversation uh, with you. I always enjoy our conversations and it's glad to share it with uh, all of your friends here. And uh, you have an open invitation to come have dinner in Riyadh anytime you want. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Uh, now, uh, I am grateful to you for a second reason. I, ap I apologize for your collaborators because I understand that you had a very good speech prepared. Maybe it could be distributed, by the way, to us uh, later on, but you have agreed to replace the speech by a, a, a discussion between the two of us. So uh, let me start by uh, a simple question. I, everybody understands that you have been extremely busy the last three days. So what uh, can you tell us uh, about the, uh, the meetings uh, you had in the last three days, especially on uh, China? Mm. Uh, well, uh, we had an uh, excellent group of meetings. We actually had uh, three uh, summits yesterday. One was uh, just our regular GCC summit, which again uh, uh, focused on uh, uh, continuing to improve and to uh, grow uh, into GCC cooperation. And actually, uh, something I did want to point out is that we announced uh, in that summit, His Royal Highness announced that we will be proposing uh, a, a renewed vision uh, for the GCC, we already have what we call the King Salman vision for the uh, GCC program, which uh, resulted in a lot of the economic integration that we've already seen, and we are now working on presenting basically version 2.0 of that. Uh, after that, we had the GCC China Summit, and then we had the Arab uh, China Summit. Both of them were inaugural events, the first of their kind. And uh, uh, for us, of course, it's an incredibly important uh, prospect to continue to increase our cooperation with our main trade partner. It's, uh, China is the main trade partner for not just Saudi Arabia, but I believe for uh, almost all of the Arab world. And uh, having this dialogue with the second largest economy in the world is for us critically important as we continue to build our partnerships uh, in the global environment in a way that fosters the opportunities for growth and prosperity for all. So in this uh, global environment, uh, how do you position yourself in the current increasing tensions between the US, China, uh, now the war in Ukraine and so forth and so on, and particularly uh, as far as the oil production is concerned? So for us, uh, from our perspective, uh, polarization is the last thing we need right now. You know, we already see tremendous pressures on the global economy, which we see you know, uh, inflation, uh, other issues, food security, and uh, more polarization is not a way to solve that. It's only a way to exacerbate it. So our opinion is that we need to build bridges that we need to strengthen connections and that we need to find areas of cooperation. Uh, the China uh, Arab World, China GC Summit was one iteration of that, just like the Jeddah Summit uh, with the US was. It's our uh, attempt to continue to build bridges with all of our international partners. You know, the kingdom is uh, this year the 15th largest economy in the world. It is the la fastest growing economy in the world. Uh, we will be uh, hopefully this year the first time reaching a trillion dollars uh, in GDP. So we are. Uh, growing in importance in part of the, uh, as part of the global economy and our position, the kingdom's position, but also the GCC's position uh, as really a bridge between East and West is something that we want to emphasize, that we want to build on, so as to address all of these challenges that we are facing. And, uh, you know, it, we live in a complicated world, a difficult world. There are always going to be issues that need to be addressed, but the best way to address them is through dialogue is through interaction, is through cooperation, and that's uh, our approach. Would you, for, to describe your own foreign policy, would you uh, accept to use the word that the Indians use, multi-alignment, or maybe multi-non-alignment? <laughs> maybe uh, you would prefer that. Uh, uh, yeah, I, it's not about alignment. It's about finding areas of cooperation. For us, our foreign policy is driven 
by our need to build sustainable prosperity first for the Saudi people, but then for the people of our region, and we hope for the people of the world. Uh, and we look for every opportunity to build on that uh, goal. So if there is an opportunity to uh, work with a, a partner on the global stage to further our uh, uh, ability to strengthen our economic uh, programs, our social programs, to strengthen our region, and that can happen only through cooperation, we will follow those uh, avenues. But if you, if you are interested in reducing, contributing to reduce uh, tensions in this, uh, as you said, highly uh, more and more complex uh, world, uh, since you are not uh, or not yet a superpower, uh, the uh, main interlocutors, I'm thinking of the uh, US and China, have to agree with the idea that uh, reducing tensions is a, a desirable uh, goal. So uh, do you think uh, that uh, today the uh, US and uh, China are willing to reduce tensions on the whole? I can't speak for whether or not they're willing, but I can tell you that it is our firm conviction is that they must, and that a rise in tensions is not just detrimental to them, but of course to all of us. And here it's important that we, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as uh, a, a leading economy, as we just said, 15th largest economy, we expect by 2030 to be at least in the top 10, if not uh, ahead of that, but also as a part of the developing world, to galvanize the voices of the developing world, to galvanize the, uh, the voices of those countries that are most interested in a brighter future, in talking to all of our partners to say, look, let us focus on the future, let us focus on cooperation. Competition is a good thing, but uh, 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 competition that leads uh, to conflict is a bad thing, it's bad for everyone. It can only uh, be destabilizing, it can only uh, 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 raise uh, uh, the prospects of uh, uh, starvation in the developing world, of deprivation, all of these things. So we need to focus on building bridges, we need to focus on cooperation, we need to focus on how do we build sustainable prosperities for us as individual countries, but also for the global community. You uh, did not uh, uh, answer to the uh, question of oil uh, mm. production, because after all, uh, President Biden, as far as you can understand, visited uh, Saudi Arabia somewhat uh, re reluctantly, uh, but he did so, well, if I read the newspapers, he did so because he expected uh, that uh, OPEC and yourself would agree to increase uh, pr production. Uh, so uh, what, uh, w what can we say about that? Uh, we can say that uh, Saudi Arabia, OPEC, OPEC Plus have a very consistent policy. Our policy is to maintain a stable market. And we have worked very, very hard to ensure that market stability in very difficult times. If we go back uh, to 2019-20 when we had COVID, we had a, a serious disruption in the oil markets. We saw prices in some areas go to negative, which disrupted investment in uh, the production of energy, which led to constraints on the markets. We intervened, we brought uh, markets back into balance. We continue to do that. And if you look at uh, uh, the oil market compared to the gas market, for instance, or compared to coal markets, whether in Europe or elsewhere, you will see that uh, oil has been relatively stable compared to all other sources of energy, even renewable energy. And why is that? Because we have been actively engaged in maintaining stability in the market. Uh, you know, we have uh, talked to all of our partners, uh, the US, others, and we have explained very much our approach and, uh, you know, the uh, recent OPEC uh, plus decision uh, going back uh, to October now, uh, 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 where we uh, announced the $2 million uh, cut. Uh, I think we can now see, given where prices are, that that decision was entirely justified. And one of the things we have to remember, uh, 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 the price has to be fair to consumers and suppliers, because without a fair price for suppliers, suppliers will stop investing and we are already seeing significant lack of investment in uh, the hydrocarbon space because of the green agenda and other issues but uh, in the long term that may be okay but in the short and medium term that is a problem because we are seeing uh, spare capacity continuing <coughs> to come down if we see a significant recovery in china which we all hope economically will benefit you know will happen if we see uh, 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 the uh, prospects of a recession dimming and global economic growth going up, we will see significant reductions of spare capacity because of the lack of investment. The only way we can ensure that there is enough investment and enough spare capacity to, uh, to cushion us from supply shocks in the near and medium term is if the price is fair to suppliers and consumers. And I would argue that the price 
at where we are, where we are now is fair. Uh, most important is it stable, which means that in, uh, investors, whether it's governments or uh, major companies, can see the prospects of a stable oil price now and into the future, uh, which means that they can make their dec investment decisions based on that stability. We don't see that in other energy markets, and that is our core priority. That is the mandate that OPEC and OPEC Plus have, price stability. Thank you very much. This is a very precise uh, answer. More generally, what can you tell us about uh, Saudi-Russia uh, relations? So we have uh, had relations uh, uh, actually since uh, after the first Gulf War, and we have continued to have strong relations, good relations. We've tried to uh, improve them. We work very closely together, of course, within OPEC, OPEC Plus historically, and that, as we, uh, I just explained, has delivered benefits uh, to the energy market, to the oil market. Uh, obviously, uh, the situation, the conflict with Ukraine, is something that is of great concern to all of the global community, and uh, you know we have expressed our opinion that in the uh, uh, United Nations General Assembly. Uh, but we, as I said in my first remarks, believe in dialogue. So our priority is dialogue, and that includes talking to uh, Russia, who we still consider uh, 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 as uh, uh, someone that we can deal with, that we have a good relationship with. We have seen uh, uh, that relationship uh, help uh, for instance, in uh, uh, some prisoner swaps. So you can build on uh, these connections, these relationships, these trusts to uh, help dialogue. You know, we have tried uh, to uh, continue to foster a dialogue between Russia and Ukraine. We continue to have an engagement. Something that uh, many don't know is that we actually have, uh, a, a commercially, our relationship with Ukraine is, uh, our trade relationship before the conflict with Ukraine was larger than it was with Russia. So we have a strong relationship with both of those parties. And we are focused on continuing to uh, foster the potential for dialogue. This conflict will only be, re uh, in the end, resolved through dialogue, and we need to focus on that. And, well, now many experts and commentators uh, complain uh, that uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, policy in the Middle East uh, is not uh, uh, totally clear, to, to say uh, the least, which, of course, might uh, have some serious implications because, uh, as they say in physics, uh, uh, nature uh, bore uh, void. So, uh, could you comment on that? Uh, I certainly think that the U.S. has an important role to play, and that part of that role is, of course, in, the, in our region, is being very engaged. I think they are engaged, and I think we are having a very good conversation uh, with our partners in the U.S., but we do need to have a real strategic dialogue and that's something that's happening. It's happening on the bilateral level, but it's also happening GCC, uh, US, it's happening Arab world, US. So we ha I think the US is playing an important role and will continue to play an important role in the region, especially from a security perspective. And if you compare uh, Biden to uh, Trump or, or even Obama, uh, can you, are there noticeable uh, differences? Every uh, president will have difference in style. Every administration yeah. will have differences yeah. in approach. And certainly, you, you know, policy is very different between a Republican administration and Democratic administration, so there will be clear differences. But in the end, I believe U.S. interests are the same, whether a, a, a Republican administration is in office, a Democratic administration is in office. They may approach uh, uh, those interests differently. But uh, we have had a strong relationship with the U.S. through multiple administrations, Republican and Democratic. So we are very accustomed to dealing with changes in approach. In the end, the joint interests that bind the U.S. to the region are the same. They continue to exist, and I believe they will continue to exist in the future. And that means uh, that the uh, um, space for cooperation between the, the Kingdom, the GCC, uh, and the U.S. will continue to be very solid. So, to continue this tour de raison, uh, as we say in English, mm. uh, the, uh, what about the GCPOA? Mm. Uh, a double question, in fact. Is there, a, 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 in your judgment, is there still a chance uh, that uh, the treaty will be saved? Uh, or is it now inevitable that uh, Iran will become a nuclear power? And if so, what do you do? So, is there still a chance? Certainly, there is always a chance. <laughs> I cannot say there is no chance. Uh, what I will ask you, does necessarily uh, reaching a JCPOA mean that we will not have a nuclear armed Iran? I am not so sure. You know, we are quite skeptical about the JCPOA. That said, we continue to support 
uh, an engagement on the JCPOA and a return to JCPOA uh, on the condition that that be a starting point, not an end point. So it be a starting point to addressing some of the deficiencies within the JCPOA and some of the other issues of concern. The signs right now are not very positive, unfortunately. Uh, uh, we hear from the uh, Iranians that they have no interest in a nuclear weapons program. Uh, it would be uh, very comforting to be able to believe that. Uh, we need more assurance on that level. Uh, if we don't reach a JCPOA, I think we enter a very, very complicated uh, uh, period in our region, a very dangerous period that we should avoid. That said, even if we did come back to a JCPOA, I'm not sure that that is the end. I think we need then to look beyond that to a stronger agreement. Can you elaborate a little further on what, on what happens if they get uh, the operational nuclear weapon? I think uh, clearly if, the, if, the, if Iran uh, gets an operational nuclear weapon, all bets are off. We are in a very dangerous space in the region. Uh, you know, we have already seen significant activity from Iran. We could see much more risk from that. And of course, regional states will not want to, you know, to be exposed so, to, to such a threat without a reaction. So you can expect that regional states will certainly uh, uh, look towards uh, how they can ensure their own security. A uh, few words on Europe, Saudi, Europe, European Union, France in particular. Because France is my country, so this of is Of course. We have started uh, last year, actually, uh, we signed a uh, strategic framework with the uh, European Union, between the GCC and the European Union, which has already uh, brought significant progress. We restarted our uh, FTA uh, talks after they had been stalled for many, many years. So that's a positive sign. And I think uh, you know, Europe is still one of our main trade partners, and it's a very important technological partner. So there's a lot we can do with Europe. I would uh, say that uh, Europe needs to be more engaged in this region. Uh, we have a lot to offer uh, Europe in this region. We are, of course, an, uh, already a very important energy partner, but we are also a very important partner for the energy transition. So Europe cannot achieve its uh, carbon neutrality goals without this region, because you cannot produce enough renewable energy in Europe. We are investing the kingdom, others in the region, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in developing uh, uh, green hydrogen capacity, in developing solar energy capacity, wind capacity, the capacity to export that green energy uh, to Europe and elsewhere. So we will be a key partner for Europe well into the uh, next century. So we want to build on that partnership. The relationship between the Kingdom and France is very, very strong. I can say uh, that we can see President Macron is very engaged in the region, is very active in trying to uh, work with uh, France's partners in the region. And we have built an uh, excellent working relationship with our French counterparts across the board, whether it's in the economic side, but also the political side, dealing with regional uh, uh, files, whether it's Lebanon, uh, Iran, etc. So we, uh, we look towards strengthening that relationship. And uh, France has been, as I said, very proactive. And that's something that we, uh, we appreciate. So, uh, I, I would like to spend the last few minutes to say a few words about the domestic situation, because I think uh, not so many people uh, in, in Europe in particular understand what is going on in Saudi Arabia, and a lot of things are going on. But before that, is there any important question on foreign affairs that I did not ask? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh. I would not presume, uh, uh, Terry, to tell you what is important in foreign affairs. That's what I call you and ask. <laughs> well, but if anyone here thinks there is one important question that I did not ask, which is very possible, you know, because, uh, but uh, apparently one, two, three, no, 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 I'm talking of global affairs, no, no, no. Well, well, app apparently, uh, I don't see. Oh, yes, yes. Maybe your record, Abraham Accord. That's a good question. Sure. sure. What's the question? Huh? What's the question? What is the answer? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, if the question, uh, it, it, it's, it's better to start from the answer. Sure. Because, after all, you have well, today a big uh, I, I effort. Can, I, I can tell you what the answer is. Yeah. The answer is a Palestinian state. The answer is? A Palestinian state. Yes. Yes. 
Yes, I, I remember the discussion in Paris on that, and, and, and that's, uh, that's a very uh, uh, serious point. So uh, next time we have the pleasure of being with you, perhaps we should concentrate with a few others on the issue of the, of the, of the Palestinian state. What? Well, now, uh, if, if, uh, I think we have maybe five four more minutes, uh, something like that. Uh, what I think we should, it would be good to take the opportunity of having you because you are uh, uh, typically representative of the new generation uh, of uh, leaders in uh, Saudi uh, Arabia. If I may uh, remind you, are uh, of course uh, Saudi uh, citizen. Uh, your father is uh, Saudi citizen, but your mother was a uh, German uh, citizen. Uh, you speak uh, Germany uh, as, as fluently as English. His English is extremely good too, I must say. Uh, so you are very in international. There is a new generation of business people open to the world. So can you just tell us uh, a few words about how you see your country today and, uh, and the dream uh, of uh, uh, the young uh, Saudis for the next uh, generation, let's say. Yeah. First, I'm actually already relatively old because I'm in my <laughs> late 40s yeah. and 70% yeah. of Saudis are under 35. So I am, uh, I'm actually on one of the later generation, but I'm happy to contribute as much as I can under the leadership uh, of His Majesty the King and the Crown Prince to setting up the future for this younger generation. And, uh, I think it's a tremendously uh, exciting time to be working in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, we are undergoing breakneck change. Uh, we are uh, most importantly working under a clear roadmap, under a clear vision, and I referred to it earlier, building sustainable prosperity for the Saudi people. And that is the absolute priority, the absolute driving ethos of everything that the government of Saudi Arabia does, whether it's domestic policy, whether it's foreign policy. So my mandate as foreign minister is very clear. My mandate is to support and to enhance the prospects of achieving the goals of, of that vision sustainable prosperity for the Saudi people. And that's what I spend most of my time on, and uh, uh, that's tremendously exciting to have a very clear uh, direction, what you're working on, what are the goals, what are the objectives, uh, and of course, we could go into any number of details, uh, but you know, we mentioned one of them, the fact that we are uh, this year going to uh, uh, probably reach $1 trillion uh, GDP size for the first time in our history. The fact that Saudi Arabia, with all of the challenges that this region presents, is the fastest growing economy in uh, 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 the world, that we are on track to being the fastest growing economy in the G20 for the next five years, according to our estimates. The fact that we have uh, uh, plans in place that will likely mean that we are, uh, by 2030, in the top eight economies in uh, the world. All of that means that it's a tremendously exciting time to be part uh, of the government under the leadership of uh, uh, the king and the crown prince. And it, it means also that we have a lot, a lot, a lot of expectations to live up to. But, you know, we have a fantastic team. We have fantastic energy within the government to work that. And most important, if you, you know, we hope you can visit us in the kingdom and uh, all of you here, you can see the energy in the kingdom. And that energy is infectious. You can see people really being excited about the future. You can see people being uh, engaged in, 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 in the future. Uh, unemployment numbers are down. Home ownership numbers uh, are at historic highs. Um, uh, you know, we are now uh, already very long around, uh, uh, on the path towards diversifying our economy away from a dependence on oil. Uh, all of these targets are moving steadily ahead, and that is contributing not just to uh, the success of the kingdom, but also we hope and we believe to the regional uh, success. Do you, of course, the country is extremely young, as you reminded us, but uh, do you still have uh, resistance, uh, some kind of social resistance from the uh, older, uh, el uh, oldest generation? So, I, as one of that older generation, I can tell you no, that... No, 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 uh, I am talking to uh, my generation, my, for instance. Uh, my generation of Saudis. Yeah. <laughs> you would be surprised. This is something that's, I think, uh, everything that the kingdom is doing, because we are doing it in a very, very well-studied way, because the leadership has taken care to study every decision 
and based on a clear logic, a clear logic of numbers, a clear logic of, um, uh, 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 of necessity, uh, everybody understands and everybody is excited. Even the older generations, uh, you know, people that are older than I, people, uh, are very, very engaged. And I hope, uh, you know, when you visit the kingdom, Terry, you will see how engaged everybody is across the board. Uh, it, you know, uh, everybody will have their opinions, but in the end, the energy, the prospect of uh, uh, moving towards the future, I think what you will hear most is, of most people is, we've been waiting for this for many years, and we're just so happy that we get to see it. So, a very last question. We could spend a lot of time with you, but you already were very generous. But uh, a very last time that would bridge the two uh, topics, that is foreign affairs and domestic affairs. There is a, a very classical subject, very much discussed by uh, uh, professors, uh, that is the relationship between domestic uh, and foreign policy. Mm. So, in your uh, position uh, today, how do you uh, see uh, this relation? Absolutely key. So, I, I alluded to it earlier. My mandate from my leadership <laughs> is very clear. Saudi Arabia's foreign policy is a tool for its domestic prosperity. That is the top priority. How can we deliver sustainable prosperity for the Saudi people. Everything we do on the foreign policy issue must be focused primarily on that. And that, of course, means protecting our interests, building partnerships, but it also means building a stable, secure region, because you cannot uh, build prosperity in a turbulent region. It also means working with our global partners to ensure global stability, because as we have seen from the conflict uh, in Ukraine, uh, a crisis anywhere in the world can have impacts all around the world. So we must, if we want to protect our pathways to sustainable prosperity, we must be engaged in the world. So one of uh, uh, the results of that mandate is that we are trying to be more engaged, not just in our immediate region, but globally, in a way that serves our interests, but that serves the interests of the wider global community, with a focus, I have to say, really on the developing world. Because for us, uh, you know, we feel very strongly that the developing world's voice has not been uh, heard enough. And we are, of course, uh, part of the developing world still. Uh, you know, and we see that the global agenda, historically, has often been set in a way that has ignored the interests of developing countries, uh, most of the time out of the best intentions, but still, uh, they have not served really effectively the developmental path of those developing countries in a way that is most effective. So we want to be part of the global conversation that, in a way that ensures everybody has a pathway to prosperity, because we, you know, even in the regional context, we have taken an approach that it is absolutely key that our immediate neighbors are not just stable, they are also prosperous. Because if they uh, have growing economies, if they have uh, 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 growing markets, that is for us an opportunity. And vice versa, if we are stable, if we are growing, we provide a great market for them. So that's the key focus for our foreign policy. You know, at a, at a different scale, it seems to me that the formulation, uh, your formulation, is very close to that uh, that we had yesterday, the similar discussion with Dr. Anwar Gargash uh, on uh, uh, the uh, UAE uh, foreign uh, foreign policy. So you, 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 the, your, your general philosophy is, is quite similar. Uh, I think if you talk to any GCC foreign minister, yeah. you will hear the same message. Yes. And this is just a reflection again that we are very much a strong unified bloc, and that we work together very effectively, that we have very similar visions. Our leadership uh, in the UAE, in the Saudi Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you know, our, the, our various countries' leaderships are very close to each other. They work together. They work towards ensuring prosperity for not just their countries, but the region. And we're going to continue to do that. I will ask uh, our European Union friends to follow your example. We are happy to share our experiences. <laughs> well, it's time to uh, end uh, this uh, session. Uh, thank you very much. I think you were great if you allow me to speak in this way. Excellent uh, discussion. And uh, I wish you all the best for you personally, for your country. And I hope that uh, Saudi Arabia will be more uh, uh, present in the uh, World Policy Conference in the uh, forthcoming uh, years. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Have a safe uh, trip uh, back. 
and I hope you will be back on time uh, in Riyadh for this uh, dinner to which I am not participating. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Terry, thank and thank you all.